I opened this video with the song September by Earth, Wind & Fire because do you remember the 21st night of September? It was almost a month ago at this point and my September wrap up is still not up. So do you remember that day? Do you remember what you were reading on that day? Do you remember what you had read in the month of September before and after that point? Because I sure do because I need to talk about it today. So welcome to my September wrap up. It is late. That is life, but books are still relevant no matter the time of the month, so who cares? I don't. I'm just still gonna talk about them and wrap them up because that's how it goes. So let me just dive right in to the books I read in September. There was a total of nine books. Two of them were audiobooks, two of them were ebooks, and two of them were advanced reading copies and one of them was a reread. The first book that I read this month was Crown of Coral and Pearl by Mara Rutherford. I got this actually as an arc on NetGalley but I had finished it in September right around the time that it had come out. There is an ocean kingdom of Varenia that prides itself on its beautiful woman and every generation the prince of Alara comes to Varenia and is given the most beautiful girl on the island as his bride. Every girl in Varenia longs to be royalty but the price is higher than they imagine. Nor and Zadie are identical twins and have always been groomed to be the next queen. However, when a childhood accident leaves Nor with a small scar on her cheek, her sister is the favored twin. Zadie, of course, is chosen to marry the crown prince, while Nor remains behind never to set foot on land. However, Zadie is gravely injured and Nor must take the place of her twin. She leaves the beautiful ocean kingdom of Renia and goes to the castle carved into the side of a mountain where she is met with her future husband, Prince Saren, who seems to be slowly losing his grip on reality. And as she grows closer to Prince Saren's brother, Prince Talon, she discovers some startling truths about the kingdom of Alara. So I ended up giving Crown of Coral and Pearl five stars. I really really just adore books about sisters and Nora and Zadie really have this very special twin bond that you can just feel while you're reading it. They really care about each other even though they are pitted against each other their whole lives. They don't let that rule their relationship and especially in that kind of setting it could be easy to have women pitted against one another but they always cared about one another and supported each other. <laughs> one character I did not like is their mother who was bitter that she wasn't chosen to be the queen and now is grooming her daughters for that life and her obsession with beauty really can just influences her daughters a lot whereas Zadie had all this pressure on her to be beautiful and not do anything too dangerous lest she get a scar where Noor is kind of shoved to the sidelines and ignored because she has a scar on her face. And there was a lot of discussion on the value of beauty which I found very thought provoking. And then What's cool about this novel is the setting is split between two different places. We have the Ocean Kingdom of Varenia, which is very bright and beautiful, and this cold mountain kingdom castle that is like just carved into this mountain and is very like unforgiving and not warm. And I really thought that Rutherford was able to create these two different settings very distinctly and pretty much um, describe them in enough depth that you could really feel the atmosphere in each place. I really adored Noor as a character. You can just see what drives her is that she really cares about her family. She always wanted to leave and explore whereas Zadie is more of a homebody and didn't want to leave the kingdom but yet they were kind of in the beginning of the novel in positions where Noor would have to stay and Zadie would have to go. So once Noor gets this opportunity to actually leave. She sees that the outside world is not everything that she's expecting and you just kind of see that she has this strength and this resilience because she's doing everything for her family and for her sister and it's just really touching. I also really enjoyed the romance in this. I thought it was like high stakes and developed very nicely and it was just a really really strong YA debut and I'm looking forward to seeing more from this author in the future. Next is Dark Dawn by Jay Kristoff because like this was just like an event. I have a whole reading vlog up on my channel. It is spoiler filled if you have already read Dark Dawn but if not you can just hear my review here. I have my US edition as well which is the one that I read and annotated. So the Nevernight Chronicles consists of Nevernight, 
God's Grave and Dark Dawn and I just adore these series and I love both the US covers and the UK covers. The Nevernight Chronicles is set in a world where the three suns never sink below the horizon. Mia Corvair had everything ripped from her when she was but a child as her family was executed. Now she is bent on exacting her revenge. She seeks out the Red Church, a school for the most talented assassins in the Iturian Empire. Mia sets out to become one of the venerated blades of the Red Church. However, there's a killer loose in the mountain and all may not be what it seems. And then Dark Dawn is the third one in this trilogy and each part of the trilogy represents birth, life, and death. And this series just goes places that just shocked me and amazed me like i truly think that jay kristoff is a literal genius his masterful and genius and just like the things that we discovered in this book and the way that he wove the lore of the world into the story is just so clever like in the beginning you're just following this assassin as she's you know going to assassin school and training and then she just goes on this journey to really try and exact her revenge but she kind of realizes along the way that her parents weren't like these great people that she thought that they were and everything is not what it seems and there are some like forces of like gods that are at work in directing her life and it is just so like detailed and immersive and then these characters you really just feel for them like I adore them all. I don't think that this series could have ended more perfectly. When I think about what happened to all of the characters it just makes perfect sense and it's so so brilliant. This was one of my most anticipated books of the year and it truly lived up to my expectations. Next I read The Night Circus by Erin Morgenstern and I read this on audio. The Night Circus arrives with no warning. No announcements precede it, it is simply there. It is called Le Cirque des Rêves and it is open only at night. However, behind the scenes, there's a fierce competition between two magicians, Celia and Marco, who have been trained since childhood on opposing systems of philosophy for the purpose of this game. Unbeknownst to them, this is a fight to the death. It is a battle of imagination and will, but despite themselves, they fall in love. However, that doesn't stop the game and as the whole cast of the circus gets drawn into their affair, the fate of the circus is hangs in the balance. And this just has very rich prose and it's like a very lyrical experience and it was really cool listening to this one on audio. I ended up giving it four out of five stars. I feel like the Night Circus is so polarizing to people which is why I found it like surprising that it was kind of just like in the middle for me. Like it was a good book. It wasn't a five star. It wasn't like a two star or a three star. I enjoyed it. It wasn't my favorite thing ever but like it was a good book. But I think it's so polarizing because of the way that it's written. I think a lot of people like character driven books and this was very very plot driven wherein it takes place over like a long expanse of time like years and years as Marco and Celia are playing this game in the circus and it's more about the plot points surrounding the circus and the things that are happening and it's just written like very beautifully but we don't get that very close perspective of the characters and what they're thinking so it kind of can feel like we don't know the characters that well um, or know their like inner thoughts because they are kind of hidden to them because it's almost like we're a specter to this circus but at the same time Erin Morgenstern's writing is so beautiful. You just feel transported to that circus. It was really cool to listen to it because I felt transported while I was listening. It was a cool novel to listen to for sure, but if you are someone that likes character-driven novels, I don't necessarily think that this would be the best fit for you. And it's also one of these stories where like the intricacies of the magic system aren't fully explained like they're explained enough that you get it but there's also like a lot that makes you think about it so if that's something that could potentially bother you like the rules make sense but they're not fully explained so it leaves a lot to the imagination and a lot for the reader to fill in and that could be something that is to your taste or not to your taste which again is why I think that this book is very polarizing where people love it or they hate it. Next I read Turtles All the Way Down by John Green. Turtles All the Way Down is about a teenager named Aza who is suffering from intense OCD and anxiety. When her friend Daisy suggests that they go on a manhunt to find a missing billionaire, Aza is drawn into the journey and reunited with a lost childhood crush. So I ended up giving Turtles All the Way Down three out of five stars. This is not a book that I would normally pick up. I really had my John Green phase like many years ago, but my grandma sent this to me and so thanks Nana. That's her little note that she put in there and she said that it was a really good book about anxiety. I really thought that the OCD and anxiety rep was very well done. I believe it maybe owned voices for John Green. Um, I'm not 100% certain. So 
it just describes like a thought spiral in a way that's very relatable to the reader and you can kind of feel Asa's emotions just like spinning out of control and it was very cool to see that on page and get that kind of representation and especially also talks about like medication for anxiety and medication management and i really liked that aspect where this novel fell short for me was the plot it starts off with the, this hunt for this billionaire and then that kind of just like falls off that was kind of just like a way to get Azad to reunite with her childhood crush and then it just kind of like stopped and then came back in the end and it just was like very unrealistic it didn't make sense to me it just like wasn't gripping and it wasn't en enough to like make me love this book even though i adored the representation um i think it's like an important book and i'm glad that it's so popular but it just wasn't the book for me Next, I read Percy Jackson and the Olympians, The Sea of Monsters. This is the second book in the Percy Jackson and the Olympians series, which I have slowly been reading. I think when I was young, I read up to the third book, so I'm excited to kind of like go beyond where I had gone when I was young, which was so long ago, I don't even really remember. This series is about Percy Jackson, who finds out that he is a demigod when he's hunted down by all these mystical creatures. He is the son of Poseidon, and so attends Camp Half-Blood, where he has many adventures with his friends. In the second book, Percy and Annabeth go searching for Grover, a satyr that is their friend that has gone missing. And they must also go searching for the fleece of Jason to protect Camp Half-Blood when its border walls are crumbling. Percy Jackson is just such a great middle grade. I gave this one 4 out of 5 stars. It is so cute and heartfelt and I love the interactions between the characters. I especially loved Tyson in this novel. He is just such a sweetie pie and I'm really glad that we were introduced to him. I think it's a really cool way to learn about Greek mythology through these cute little stories and we're just getting into some of the larger plot for this entire series and I'm excited to see where it picks up and goes. The next book that I picked up is Fireborn by Rosaria Munda which is an arc that I was sent by Penguin Teen so thank you Penguin Teen for sending this my way. This is a debut novel set in a world where the dragon lords were pushed out of power and now a new regime is in place. Dragons were once written by these dragon lord families alone but now there is a new test to find skilled riders that bond with these dragons that are taken into the dragon academy. Annie and Lee are both rising stars in this regime. They have been friends since they were little in an orphanage and are both chosen by the dragons. However, Lee has a secret. He's actually Leo, the son of one of the dragon lords that was killed in the revolution. Now there is a threat of another war and Lee must decide if he is loyal to his regime or his surviving family that has been in hiding, whereas Annie must decide if she should protect Lee or or step up to be the champion that her city needs. This is just a novel that is jam-packed with political intrigue and I ended up giving it three out of five stars. Munda heavily drew inspiration from Virgil's Aeneid and Plato's Republic. If you are fans of those old texts and that epic sort of style, I think you would really like this novel, but it is so, so heavy on the politics because we have this new regime coming in. And one of the things that I really liked is that this book really makes the point that like no side is 100% good or 100% evil. Both have good things and bad things about them. There is a really cool dragon system where as dragons will spark or they will be able to fully breathe fire and that can kind of determine the maturity of your fleet and if you're ready for war. When you're riding your dragon you can potentially connect mines but that is called spilling over and it could potentially be dangerous or you can use it as a tactic which is cool. Like it's very detailed in terms of the connections with the dragons and the lore of the world. This is very built up. However I just like did not really connect with the characters and especially Annie to me was very flat and boring. She was at the forefront of this dragon riding class and yet she seemed like she had no oomph to her. Like she was very shy and timid and I just feel like where she was didn't make sense with her personality until later in the book she starts coming out of her shell a little bit more. There were just like weird romances in here too. Um, and it just like the tension between the characters and the pacing of it didn't make sense. There were like a lot of pacing issues where it was just very slow in the beginning and it just took me a while to get through it. However, it is a really action-packed book about dragons and had a lot of politics to really sink your teeth into if that is your thing. Next, I read Carry On by Rainbow Rowell. This was the audiobook that I read and it is a reread for me. 
Carry On is kind of like gay Harry Potter satire where we have Simon Snow who is the worst chosen one to ever have been chosen and his roommate Baz that may or may not be a vampire and it, it just kind of goes from there in their final year at Watford Schools for Magics where they are facing the insidious humdrum or the evil that has been chasing Simon down ever since he enrolled in the school. I gave it five out of five stars both time that I've read it. I really like the audiobook. I really found it to be cute, heartwarming, and funny, and I just love the interactions between all of the characters. It's just like a fun satire, um, and I adore the romance between Simon and Bess. However, moving on to our next book, I read Wayward Son by Rainbow Rowell, and this was one of my most anticipated books of the year, and I think it's my most disappointing book of the year. This is kind of after the events of Carry On. So, to put this in context, Carry On was supposed to be a standalone, and now all of a sudden this, it's the Simon Snow series, and there is going to be another book after this one. This kind of picks up after the events of the last book, and Simon is depressed, so Simon, Baz, and Penny decide to go on a road trip across America, and like, just chaos ensues, basically. Um, I give this book 3 out of 5 stars. I kind of want to lower my rating to two out of five stars. I think the thing that just does not make sense with this series is there were no plans to continue this series. So there were no like strings and like storylines left open in the first book. So like, you know, like every series has an arc or every story has an arc, right? Like beginning, middle, end. But that was all compacted into Carry On. There was nothing left open. And I thought that this could be like a really interesting way to explore like the post stuff that happens after a story is over um, and maybe like, you know, Rainbow Rowell could recreate that kind of magic that she had in the first book and it, it just fell completely flat. I had no idea what was going on in the plot. It was just like all over the place. I was really excited to kind of see like Simon grapple with his depression and I just felt like the characters weren't acting like themselves. The plot made no sense, kind of out of nowhere random and then it was just left so open-ended at the end because we're getting another book. But like it just didn't make sense and like it was just so so different from you know carry on. Like for example, when I read Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, they don't go to Hogwarts. Like, the structure of the book is so different because they can't go back to Hogwarts. It's dangerous, but, like, it, it works. They're in this different setting, but it still works, even though maybe it feels a little bit different, but it does not work in this one. <laughs> the last book that I have to talk about for September is The Governess Game by Tessa Dare. This is the second in a series of, I think it's called the Girl Meets Duke series, and this is about a group of four friends that all meet dukes in random ways and it's a romance story between Alexandra Mountbatten who is a clock setter in London but when she loses her clock setting um device she accepts a job as a nanny in the house of Chase Reynold taking care of his two young wards that are these little girls that just cause chaos <laughs> And in the process, they kind of end up falling for one another. That's the basic premise of the book. And I freaking adore Tessa Dare for historical romance. I think she just does it so well. I love the intrigue of the 1800s and how like society was a lot more rigid than it is today. So it just makes everything that much more like steamy and you know, like forbidden. And I just thought the romance between them was very sweet and they each had like issues that they had to work on and they worked through it together and I think Tessa Dare does a really good job of that and I also just love the two little girls that Alex is taking care of. I think that they are so chaotic and it just really brings out like a soft side in both of the characters. Overall just really well done historical romance and I gave it 4.5 out of 5 stars and I am absolutely looking forward to continuing on with this series and checking out more of Tessa Dare's works. And with that, that is my conclusion of my September wrap-up. This is actually probably the fastest that I've ever filmed a wrap-up because I had all my reviews written down on Goodreads, which is what I'm going to be doing from now on because it is the key to filming smoothly with wrap-ups. With that being said, look out for my October wrap-up soon because October is almost over and Hopefully I'll get it out quicker than I got out September's. Okay, have some fun, read some books, and I'll catch you guys in the next one.